Good morning, everybody, and thank you uh, for your very kind invitation for Manos and the Greek Society. So let's talk about the subscap deficiency. As you can see in this title, there are three questions. What is a subscap unrepairable? And what about the lab dorsi and all the pec major transfer? For that, here's my disclosure. Um, so when to consider a subscap unrepairable? For me, the problem is in fact, very easy. Uh, if you have no arthritis, you have, for example, this woman with a glenoid retraction of a surprise spinatus, a glenoid retraction of a subscap, and of course, a fat infiltration of the muscles, especially if this patient has been operated on uh, many years ago. So it is a revision surgery. I'm not better by my colleagues, and I think we cannot propose a new repair. For me, it is, a, it is an indication of a uh, of a transfer. So, so why worry about the subscap? In fact, you have the subscap anterior from the shoulder, the supraspinatus, and you have the both lesions of the two muscles. You will have an anterior superior escape with the imbalance of the vertical and horizontal plane of the shoulder. And this can appear in more than 80% of the cases if you look, uh, if you read the publication of Philip Collin. So this is a very uh, difficult point, and uh, what are the, the options today? Of course, we can discuss about a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, like we've just seen this morning. But in this patient, most of the time, they are young, and there is no arthritis. You can discuss about the PEC minor transfer, described by Ruiz, Palladini, and Valenti with an arthroscopic procedure, but this transfer is very weak and short. Nevertheless, my topic today is what about the PEC major transfer in this indication, and why not the lat dorsi transfer? So, first of all, let's talk about the PEC major transfer. It was the topic of uh, Philippe Moroder, which is not here, and I will make it uh, and give you my point of view. So, the first publication of the PEC major transfer was done by uh, Michael Wirt. And you can see here the paper, and he imagined first this indication. But to understand what he wanted to say, let's go back to the anatomy, because the anatomy is the heart of all the tendon transfer. So uh, as you can see, uh, Leonardo da Vinci thought there was four uh, portions, four, four tendons onto a subscap. In fact, we know today that there are no four, but only three. But even this uh, draw is wrong, because uh, we consider now that, in fact, there are only two portions. There is the clavicle head of the pec major, and there is the sternocostal head of the pec major. So only two, even if the anatomist prefer to say three. So on the uh, humeral insertion, the tendon is very flat, about five centimeters on the lateral lip of a bicipital groove. But in fact, this insertion is very difficult to understand. And if you take, if you try to make this transfer, most of the time you make a mistake and you take all the pec major because it's very difficult to understand how exactly it is. As you can see, the surgical anatomy, you have the anterior lamina, which is in fact the clavicular portion. And it's turned around uh, the distal one, the posterior lamina, and this creates a giant shape onto the humerus. And this is the reason why sometimes it's difficult to harvest it. Uh, most of the time, you try to take only one portion. And at the end, you have the two portions, and it's not very nice for a patient with aesthetic problems. So two portions, yes, because in fact, you have two nerves. There is the medial nerve, medial pectoral nerve, and distally, you have a lateral pectoral nerve, so only two nerves. So this is the reason why we consider that if you want to make a tendon transfer, you can take either both portions or one or the other one, but not there is no three portion in fact. So this is cadaver lab uh, approach. And uh, if you want to harvest a uh, pec major, you have to make a delta pectoral approach. And you have to go distally to increase your incision and to control everything. So you can see uh, very quickly, of course, the pec major, 
medially from the cephalic vein, and if you put the arm in abduction and interrotation, you can release deeper and medially your tendon. And at this point, it's very difficult to understand, so take care, because you have to go medially between the two muscles, uh, the two portions of, uh, of the pec major, to understand how it will be go laterally. Otherwise, again, you will make some mistake when you will arrest it. You have to separate the two muscle bellies, and then you go laterally, and will, you will be able to understand how are the tendon insertion. So the clavicular portion is more muscular than the sternal portion, which is more tendinous, and it's stronger. So you can see on your right, uh, all the white is the sternocostal portion, the distal one, and this is easier to harvest because it's stronger and the course is longer. Okay, so now uh, what about the surgical technique? You can, uh, you can take this one to go to the subscap, this is the sternocostal one, or you can take the clavicular portion to go at the same portion to repair the subscap. Uh, in our experience, we prefer to take, of course, the sternocostal one, but you can take the superior one. So these are the two neurovascular pedicles, and again, there is the medial one and the lateral one, and you have to take care when you release the portion not to cut it, of course. And it's, uh, the problem is this tendon or this muscle belly has a very short excursion, and it's just enough for the subscap, but you cannot really go uh, very far away from uh, this insertion. One of the problems of a pec major is it is a muscle coming from the anterior chest wall, but as you can see, the subscap is coming from the scapula from the posterior chest wall, and there is a 90 degrees uh, difference of traction per line, and because of that, uh, some authors have decided to go behind the conjoint tendon, underneath, just to uh, align the natural uh, direction of a subscap. But you can see here this biomechanical study, you can put your transfer above the conjoint tendon or underneath, but in fact, uh, it's up to you because uh, the publication did not really show any difference between these two techniques, in fact. So if you want to go underneath, under the conjoint tendon, take care about the musculocutinous nerve and the axial nerve, because you can see you have some anatomic variations, and you have to release under the coracoid process and under the conjoint tendon, and you can damage uh, this nerve, so take care. And because of that, uh, if you want to take all the pec major, and to go underneath the conjoint tendon, it could be too big and you can create some damage and I'm not sure it's a good idea for that. As you can see, there are some accessory branches uh, coming up uh, to the conjoint tendon, uh, for coming from the, from, the, from the musculoskeletal nerve. So what about the lab dorsi transfer now? Um, why, why a lap dorsi transfer? Just because, as you can see, the lap dorsi comes from the posterior chest wall, and it's exactly parallel to the subscap, and biomechanically, there is a better anatomy, and this is, in fact, a subscap-like tendon. And Bassem el Hassan uh, from la Mayo Clinic first published the anatomic called feasibility of this technique, and I published uh, an arthroscopic technique uh, to harvest it and with a clinical uh, report. So you can see here the two lines of pool of the uh, subscap and the lat dorsi are very close, in fact, and it replicates the line of pool, and because of that, we think that this transfer could be better than the pec major. So let's go back to the anatomy again. Uh, the lat dorsi is a very big muscle, and there is uh, only one pedicle, very distal from the humerus side. It's conjoined with the teres major, and probably this is a very difficult or demanding technique if you want to separate the lat dorsi from the teres major. So, as you can see, it's a very big muscle coming from the distal part of the body, 
And because of that, you have to understand something very important. If you want to open uh, the, uh, the, 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 the axial field to harvest, you will go from distal to proximal. If you want to, to make it arthroscopically, as I will show you, you have to go from superior to distal, and this reverse the position of many things in your anatomy field. Um, one of the points is here. Um, because it's a very, very big tendon, you can manage it everywhere where you want, from back to the back of the shoulder, so you can reconstruct the posterior and superior rotator cuff chair, but you can put it just anteriorly onto the subscap and even onto uh, the superior part of the human head. It's possible because the excursion is very long. And you have some connection with the apex of the scapula, and you can see this anatomic draw is wrong because there is a distance between the apex of the scapula and the muscle belly. In fact, there are very close connection, and if you do not release this area, probably you will not be able to pull up your transfer far enough. So when you go to arthroscopic uh, procedure, you, have, you, you go up, and the first step is you will have to understand what is the space between the lat dorsi, just on the back, with the teres major, and the pec major. And you have to follow this, uh, this line. And remember that the lat dorsi is posterior. Uh, on the opposite, the teres major is anterior. So if you play internal rotation with your patient, you will uh, increase, you, you will, uh, you will uh, increase the size of the space, and the dissection will be easier. So this is an arthroscopic view. You can see here the pec major. So you, you, you have to go through under the pec major, which is anterior. And if you go posteriorly, you can see here uh, the radial nerve. And uh, it, will be, uh, it will be the direction where you have to go. So now, uh, to, to become easier, uh, you have to, to follow the bicipital row, which is just here. Of course, you have to treat the biceps, and you can cut the upper part of the, of the pec major, just like when you make a shoulder prosthesis, because this will increase the space and the dissection will be easier. So now, the, the danger, the problem is the radial nerve. As you can see here, the radial nerve will cross the tendon of the lat dorsi, and the axial nerve will be vertical through the quadrilateral space, and we'll see the three sisters uh, at the distal part of the uh, uh, subscap, just here. So, I have a problem with uh, my mouse. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, uh, you have to understand this is very perfectly because you can cut the radial nerve or you can damage the axial nerve. And you have, of course, this cell with that, so, so take care, of course. Yes, so this is, this is what you see under the, under the, the congenital tendon. You, what is white, this is the radial nerve, you can see. In fact, it's very anterior, and the lat dorsi is uh, more posterior here, the white surface is posterior, so you just lift up the radial nerve and you will see uh, the lat dorsi uh, posteriorly. I, I, I think there is a problem. Yes, so after that, um, you have to separate the lat dorsi from the teres major, and I think this is probably the most demanding step to do because you have anatomical variations and very close connection in between. And this is what uh, you have to do. So of course, this is a draw. It's very easy. But uh, in the, this is an open procedure. And you have to separate, uh, to release the lat dorsi from uh, the teres major. And you can see how, how there are these connections. And you have, you have to make it arthroscopically to separate, because it's not possible to take both if you want to go anteriorly uh, um, to the subscap. Again, there is the. Uh, this is on the left, you can see the, um, the lat dorsi, the white, and just behind the lat dorsi, this is the radial nerve again. You have to detach uh, the connection at the distal part of the lat dorsi to the long head of the triceps, and 
uh, you can see the radial nerve which cross it and it's very dangerous. Then you can harvest and detach all the lat dorsi and you can use this uh, endoscopic scissors to continue the release between the two tendons. So superiorly it is the lat dorsi, inferiorly it is the teres major. And you have to follow the, as deep as possible over uh, the radial nerve just to raise that. And you can see this very close connection and sometimes <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, to this is for me probably the point, uh, the most uh, demanding step of, of, of the procedure. So, uh, and now you have to go as deep as possible. You can see the teres major at the inferior part of the picture, the lat dorsi white superior, and you can see this uh, connection, uh, perpendicular connection with the long elbow triceps. If you do not release this connection, you will not be able to uh, lift up or to pull up your long head or your, your, your lat dorsi to the uh, insertion of your subscap. So it is very, very important to make that. And uh, uh, now, of course, uh, this is the second point, technical demanding, because you have to harvest your tendon. So I, I make it, of course, like, like you see, with a triple, uh, triple crack of suture. And then you can cut it because uh, at the very beginning of my experience, I just cut and I take with a small axillary incision. But now I make it with a full arthroscopic technique. I will show it uh, next Saturday uh, with a real life surgery of that. And after, uh, when it's done, you take it, you go onto the footprint of the subscap to fix it uh, uh, like that. So uh, you, you have a lat dorsi here onto the footprint of the subscap, and in fact, you have to repair your, 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 your subscap deficiency. So, so five minutes, just the discussion between the lat dorsi and the pec major transfer, which is the best one. Very difficult to answer. Uh, this is the first publication of uh, my friend from Korea, Shang Hibek, and he'll show that, uh, as you can see, after one year of uh, follow-up, uh, the, the belly press test is negative for most of the patients. So that means this transfer is active. And this is a point because uh, this is the goal of this surgery, to rebalance the shoulder and to have an active and dynamic transfer. But uh, <coughs> this is the publication of, uh, of for the pec major transfer, the open one. And you can see that in that situation, the, the, the pec major seems to give also a uh, negativation of a, of a belly press test. This is surprising for me because the pec major has not a biomechanical uh, line of pull, lateral traction, very interesting, but we have to, uh, to, to admit that uh, the internal rotation increase after the surgery and the transfer of pec major. And this is the best paper written by uh, Philippe moreau uh, which is here, and after 20, 27 patients and more than 10 years of follow-up, he showed that the follow-up is uh, very good with uh, uh, negativation of the belly press test. And uh, we have to admit that you can see in green, this is the internal rotation. After 10 years, you have an improvement of the active internal rotation. So the pec major transfer works. We cannot say it doesn't work. So now, if you want to, to match uh, the two techniques, uh, biomechanically, the lat dorsi transfer is better. Uh, if you look at the dynamic aspect of the transfer, the, the public question show that uh, both uh, transfer works. Uh, it's possible to make the lat dorsi transfer arthroscopically, as I've shown you, uh, the pec major, I'm not sure. Uh, the constant score is the same at the revision for both techniques, and the follow-up, of course, is better for the pec major because the, the only publication have more than 10 years of follow-up. So the lat dorsi right now cannot be the best one. Uh, so in conclusion, I think uh, uh, today the pec major is still the gold standard because it works very well with more than 10 years of follow-up and an open procedure. But the lat dorsi could be an alternative and we're waiting for more publication for that. Thank you very much.